I'm very happy to be here, and especially on Halloween. My broom is in the shop, so I had to fly Southwest Airlines, so uh, I did get here, though. So today we're going to talk about um, semiconductor packaging, and I've got a little bit of a tutorial put together to start this off, and then we're going to talk about one of the hottest topics going right now, which is 3D ICs. And I'm going to give you enough background, I think, but you know, feel free to save your questions and we can answer them at the end. And, um, or if you have a burning question, you can interrupt me during the presentation. First of all, in the good old days, life was simple. You just stuck your IC into one of these clever little packages with legs on it that was basically a dip. It could have been either ceramic or plastic. And life was good. And then things got a little more complicated uh, where we introduced all these various packages that are still using uh, lead frames, which are still around today, by the way. But mostly it was a lead frame type package. Then we started introducing these structures called laminate substrates instead of just a lead frame to put this stuff on. Higher pin counts, things got a little more complex. And then all the way up, they started getting even more complex because we started stacking things, we started putting things in modules. So basically, suffice it to say that the complexity in the packaging has grown over time and still continues to grow. If we look at where we basically have gone, why are they all from MCOR? Because MCOR gave me the slide. <laughs> so, but this slide we made up ourselves. So you can see that you know, basically we still have a lot of these things called dip packages, even though they've been around a really long time. We've progressed all the way to a TSOP. Um, and these acronyms are, are kind of thrown around a lot. And I have an acronym sheet that I'll give you if anybody's interested in learning all the terms for this. But um, thin, small, outline package is the TSOP. And we basically have gone into this era, which we call the area array package, where we have things like ball grid array, CSP, stack packages, everybody wants to go high, more dense on the board so that the only way to go is up, so we got third dimensional packages. And I'm going to introduce all these concepts to you, and then the ultimate package being a wafer level package, which is no package at all. So let's take a look at the, some of these package types. Um, first, the area array package is basically, it's um, what we call a ball grid array. And Mostly, it could be a plastic or laminate substrate. It could be a ceramic substrate. It could be tape or flex, although we don't see much of those anymore because of the expense and the lack of infrastructure in that. But these packages are pretty much found on a lot of your products today, whether it's a laptop or a portable product. And they basically look like as shown here. Um, if you look at the construction of this, typically the plastic ball grid array or PBGA has a laminate substrate. Um, if we have a laser pointer, we can see that this is the laminate substrate. The early ones were wire bonded to that substrate, and then some kind of epoxy mold compound on the top part. This substrate has typically been a BT resin, although there are other substrates that can be used. And then these balls are put on the package, and it's mounted to the board. When these were first introduced, people were you know, used to the old packages with lead frames, and they were used to inspecting the package once it was put on the board. So they kind of freaked out because they couldn't see these things because they're underneath this, and the only way you could see them was with an x-ray. So, but people got around that, and they were able to, you know, these were able to move into very, very high volume production. Um, if we look at some of the other type packages that are also being used, instead of wire bonds, people are doing a flip chip package where it's, um, the die is mounted with little bumps on it onto this carrier, which could be either laminate or ceramic. And then that is, then that's all inside the package. And then the balls are solder balls on the bottom, and we attach that to the board. So this is a typical motherboard. This just happens to be an old Intel motherboard with a package. And you can see where that package would fit on this board. And this is a flip chip package. Uh, you can see the exposed die. There's no lid on this. So this die has been mounted onto the board. And so these are very common in all of your processor packages or something like that would have a package like that. Um, flip chip. I use the term flip chip. Flip chip is basically a bump on a die. And you could have all kinds of different types of bumps. A very common term you'll hear used is C4. C4 stands for Controlled Collapse Chip Connection. 
That's kind of a long word, and when IBM invented that term, the secretaries had to type it up, and that was too long to type, so they shortened it to just call it C4, and so that's what a lot of people will call, a, they will use that general term to refer to a flip chip. But mostly it's a high temperature solder bump in the early days, a eutectic low temperature solder bump. Um, in some cases, when it's um, a high temperature solder to a laminate, there'd be some uh, solder put on the board and then it would be attached. Um, there are also polymer bumps that can be used. There's an isotropic conductive film that can be used. There is also some um, other conductive adhesives that can be used, but the majority has typically been the uh, solder bump. If we look at what one of these things basically looks like, your die sizes are, can be up to, say, 25 millimeters um, on a side. The I.O. counts up to thousands. Minimum bump pitch somewhere, probably a, a 130 micron is probably where we are today. Um, very small bump diameters, bump heights of 100 micron being typical. Um, and a fairly thin package from 0.4 to 0.75 millimeters. Uh, mostly laminate substrate, but some ceramics. And here's a couple of pictures to show you what these things look like in the package. This is actually some flip chip devices mounted on a little module. So if we look to where kind of the bumps have gone, the actual original IBM bump was a copper ball back in the 1960s. And through the widespread adoption of flip chip we saw the introduction of a high lead bump that was fabricated using an evaporation process, which turns out to be a fairly expensive process, but it was made very popular by IBM. The technology was licensed to companies like Motorola and AMD with a cross-licensing agreement to Intel. Now, the industry moved from this evaporated bump to a plated bump, and that's pretty much what we're using today. That's in all the uh, Intel processors, TI, IBM, Motorola, which became Freescale, AMD, TSMC, they all use some of these bumps. So the industry is now in the process of moving something new, which is called a copper pillar or copper post. So I like to call this back to the future. We started out with copper, we're going back to copper. The difference being that on this post that we have now, there'll be a little bit of a cap, as you can see here, that is a solder, and that will be connected. So basically, Intel started this uh, transition with the Pressler processor. Now, if you look at any Intel part, they'll all be a copper pillar with some solder cap on it. And by 2013, 2014, we expect this type of technology for the flip chip bump to move into very high volume production. Some of the drivers for this growth in the flip chip technology are your very high performance products. ASICs, field programmable gate arrays, DSPs, chipsets, graphics, digital TV, uh, other like media products, <clears throat> and then a lot of our wireless um, products being driven by form factor and performance, a lot of our baseband processors moving to flip chip, and I'll talk about this thing called the package on package, or POP, and that is an application processor moving to flip chip in that. So let's talk about a CSP, which is basically the idea of shrinking down one of these packages, and basically a chip scale or chip size package is what CSP stands for. Um, it's a, a package that's basically the same area almost as a chip, so it would be the official definition is with a package with an edge dimension no more than 1.2 times that of the die inside. But it became a marketing term, so if you take apart, anybody got a new iPhone 5 here in the room? Okay, if we ripped open your phone, and we looked at one of these boards, we would find a lot of CSPs in it, chip scale or chip size packages. You'll notice that this is not much space on this board. It's all crammed full. So the introduction of the chip scale package or chip size package is really what enabled a lot of our portable products because it allowed us to package the die in something almost the same size as the die and crack, cram it all on that board. And, you know, so this, this really is the, the era of the chip scale package that we're in, in today. Now, another thing about these portable products, did you notice how thin that I, Apple iPhone 5 was? Amazingly thin. Well, thin is in. So everybody wants to make their product thinner, smaller, but they still want a lot of function in it. So the only way to do that is to have a low Z height in it. So if you'll notice, iPhone has the record now for the thinnest product. Um, iPad is, is, too, is pretty thin also. 
But y this, this is really enabled by a lot of these things called wafer level packages in it and a lot of the chip scale packages that are very thin, low profile. So that's really what, kind of what's driving a lot of our packaging trends. Now, we made this chart and put together all the different chip size packages. And you'll notice that there's a lot of different construction. We can have a lot of different type substrates, uh, maybe a flex circuit, a rigid substrate. It could be mostly laminate, but you could have some um, lead frame types as well. A lot of different structures, but they're all called chip size packages. And that's what you'll find. You'll find a lot of these different products on that mobile phone board. And basically used to package a lot of different devices, whether it's flash, ASICs, controllers, DSP, processors, um, analog devices, many of your analog devices. And then the ultimate chip scale package would be a wafer level package, which is basically what we call a WLP. And those are basically the same size as the die itself, just with bumps on it. So that is a very, very, the lowest profile package you can possibly get. So every iPhone that's come out, has had a few more of this type package in it because it's such the low profile and very small package. And we expect that trend to continue. This, well, as you can see, this is very low profile because there is no package around it. This is the package itself. The die and the package are the same. So all we've done is basically taken a piece of silicon and we put solder balls on that and then we've attached that to the board. So you can see that this, obviously, is much thinner than anything that has a substrate on it in a package. I mean, obviously, if you'd use a flex circuit piece, it could be fairly thin. But this would be the ultimate with no substrate at all. So if you want a really, really thin product, you really have to have something that is almost packageless. But we're, we're, we're still having an ability to do all this bump fabrication in the form of wafer level package. So, this is an example of one of these lead frame type packages. You'll see that they're pads, not balls on it, but it's still called a chip scale package. Um, it's a very, very small package, though, and it can be fairly thin as well. But let me talk a little bit more about these wafer level packages or WLPs. This is, uh, basically, they could be up to, they might be up to as large as 8 millimeters or 9 millimeters on a side. Um, we've seen some up to close to 400 IOs. Um, they are very use a very small bump diameter, small bump height. A package height can be down to maybe, you know, 0.3 millimeters. And we've seen everything from 150 millimeter wafers to 200 millimeter wafers, 300 millimeter wafers. A lot of stuff is on 300 millimeter wafers, but we have increasing demand right now for 200 millimeter wafers because a lot of analog parts are fabricated on this and there's an increasing number of analog devices being packaged this way. This is what one of these things looks like. This happens to be an international rectifier part. So you can see that it's only a 1.5 by 1.5 millimeter part. These are these solder bumps that are formed on the top of it. And then that, that is the entire package, the structure like that. TI has made a lot of these little parts here. You can see that, you know, typically these are not, there are not many on them, um, not many balls on them. Say there's two, uh, four, six, eight on this. But you also have some uh, examples that are up to 308 or 309 balls. This is an example of a power management device from Fujitsu. And <clears throat> this is one of the highest ones that we've seen. But these are down at 0.4 millimeter pitch. We are seeing things go to 0.3 millimeter pitch in the future. So these balls are getting tighter and tighter, the distance between them on this. And basically, these are used for a lot of different type devices. Um, analog devices, the power management, as I mentioned, RF, wireless LAN, integrated passive devices, LED drivers, sound chips, all these things that you find in phones. So you, this is really, the phone is really the highest volume driver for this. Um, as I mentioned, you'll probably see um, about nine in the, nine or so in the last, latest phone from Apple. Uh, digital cameras and camcorders have them, MP3 players like iPods have them, portable navigation systems, watch modules, uh, laptop and tablets, um, medical and automotive are even looking at this package. So we're going to see a lot more of this. And obviously, um, it's a very small package. So let me say a little bit about the 3D structures and where we're going with that before we go into some of these more exotic things. There, I have some samples with me today of 3D packages. Uh, these are um, basically, they could be, they're stacks of die. This is actually a stack using wire bond. This is from Samsung. This is probably flash memory. Um, you can also, this is an edge connection for Irvine sensors on a, uh, on a stacking 
theme here. This is vertical circuits. You can see the edge connection here. And a company in France called 3D Plus with all kinds of cubes, and I have a sample of those where they're all stacked up, metalized on the side. And um, they basically are used in a lot of space applications, military applications, um, very interesting technology. And then we have also a type of package where we can stack dye inside the package and then stack the packages on top of each other, and that's called a package on package, a POP. So basically, there's a lot of ways you can go 3D and still be in some kind of package. Um, some of the thinnest packages in this type of category would be a stack die CSP where we have wire bonds. You can see here these nice, um, nice wire bonds here. Doesn't that look like it'd be fun to assemble? Um, the die are very thin and they're stacked inside the package, typically two or more per die, per die per package. And they're done by either the semiconductor maker or the subcontractor like an Amcor or an ASE or Spill or Stats Chip Pack. Wire bond is most common, but we see a lot of increased use of flip chip, especially on this bottom die. You might have a flip chip bump here. The substrate is typically flex circuit or laminate, mostly laminate, a little bit of flex circuit still. But basically, it takes a, a very um, specific process to fabricate this on the wire bond. There's a, basically, you have a bond that goes, um, you, you'll do a, 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 a down bond and down and back. So it's a special process for, for doing this that people had to develop in order to do this stacking. Okay, this is a, the, uh, now most of that I showed you was all memory, but people also were doing a lot of stacking of logic and memory. This is one of the early OMAP processors and an SDRAM stacked together with wire bond. Now the interesting thing about this is this was developed for Nokia's phones and it en enabled the thinnest possible package by doing this very good electrical performance. But the problem was that TI makes processors. They don't make memory anymore. They got rid of that business a long time ago. But they had to go buy the memory. Memory is a commodity. It changes prices. So one day, they might be paying $5 for the memory. By the time they assembled this and got this to market, the memory might be worth only $2. So somebody had to eat $3 worth of margin. So even though this was the most elegant solution, the lowest profile, maybe the best electrical performance, this became a business nightmare because of the margin involved. And so this package actually was replaced by what we call the package on package. This is where individual die are stacked. It could be this top typically is memory. It could be one memory or it could be multiple stacked memory. But that would be done by the memory supplier. And then typically this bottom package would be the log logic package. And that would be each individually packaged and tested. And then those would be typically shipped to be assembled at board level assembly for the product. Now, there are some cases like Samsung where they stack them internally before they ship them for board level assembly. But typically, these things, almost every smartphone, almost every tablet will have one of these things in it, at least. A lot of cameras as well. A lot of infrastructure was required to develop it. And if you look at this, you go, well, gosh, that's a lot thicker. And you just told me that everybody wants a thin product. Yes, but the business reasons for doing this trumped the technology reasons for doing it the other way. And that's really the takeaway from some of the things I'm going to talk. Every time there's a technology solution, you have to also make sure it makes sense from the business standpoint as well. So even though this has cost more, more substrates in here, because you pretest everything, you throw away less of them, you have the business problems of who's got the margin covered solved. So this has been a very, very, very popular package.